Hello everyone. I'm absolutely thrilled to have received such a huge number of questions already about my debut novel, The Healing Touch. I feel the best way to respond is via a series of short blogs, of which this one is the first. But before I answer any questions, I want to say thank you very, very much to everyone who bought the book, who left fantastic reviews, and who's contacted me with these fantastic questions. I really appreciate it enormously. Um, it's kind of exciting to share it with you all. I'm genuinely amazed that the novel has raised so many questions, I have to say, and quite a few debates too. <laughs> but I'm happily, happily so, because I think all art must affect us in some way or another. I mean, I've been a performer for most of my life, as many of you know, and I feel that that is what art is about. If it makes us question things, that's even better, you know, because I think it's the best way to learn, to think new thoughts, to expand, to get to know ourselves and others as well, don't you think? So, I will now endeavour to answer each of these questions as fully as I can. Right, so the first question actually comes from a number of readers. They wanted to know, how did I start writing? Well, I realise many people know me as a singer, actress, director, performer, or whatever, and in that way, I feel I've always told stories through my art. But what people don't know is that I've always written as well. Um, I've written children's stories, adult novels, I've written plays, magazine for articles, all kinds of things. And I have been published a few times previously, but under a different name. So this is the first time I felt I needed to write something that I passionately wanted to share with the world. And so I just started. <laughs> I think that's the best way to do things, is to just start. I mean, often starting is the hardest part, isn't it? Um, I often hear people saying, oh, I want to, I'm going to write a novel, I'm going to write, they say it for years, I'm going to write a novel. Well, start. You know, even if you write just a hundred words a day, if you keep doing it and you do it every day, then just over two years you'll have a completed novel. Um, but I'll bet as your story grows you'll want to write more every day. I mean, I'm always astonished actually at writers who can turn out novels, completed novels, in sort of four or five months but they are doing it, so it's possible. It, you just have to, ke have to keep doing it. Um, the other day, I heard something very interesting, actually. Um, someone was saying that if you thought of your novel as a blog, a series of blogs, and you wrote a blog, one blog a week for 1,500 words, say, something like that, then by the end of the year, your novel would be completed. So if you wrote several blogs per week, your novel will be finished quicker. It's doable, right? So, yeah, so that's my message, I think. Just start. That's how I did it. <laughs> okay, so another question. This, again, was by a number of readers. Um, they wanted to know what inspired this novel. It's an easy question to answer. People who know me would know that the death of my dear friend and soul brother, Stephen McGilvray, really impacted on me and it was a huge shock. It, I don't mind confessing, it derailed me utterly. I, you know, I've lost other people before, as we all do, and some people who were very, very important to me and I was very sad, naturally, but I think it was the suddenness of Stephen's death and the way in which it happened. Um, it totally threw my life into disarray, I have to say. And, you know, because apart from us having worked together on several different creative projects, um, we kind of found a kindred spirit in each other. And I think that developed into a deep and and friendship and a bond that was suddenly sort of cut. Um, it was very hard. Um, 
I'd never had such an experience before in my life and I can honestly say I never want that again. I mean Stephen was the most creative person I've ever met and I've, ever, I've never worked with anyone like him. He was also the most beautiful soul I've ever had the privilege of knowing so it was a double whammy I think. Um, but when it became clear that there was never going to be a definitive answer as to why he actually died, I knew I had to write his story. I feel perhaps, maybe I'm being unfair, but I feel that if Stephen had been a famous person, his case would have been dealt with very differently. So the healing touch was my way of telling his story and of me trying to find closure. And it seems to have struck a chord with quite a lot of people, so I'm glad I was able to do that and, and bring some kind of healing for others as well. But I don't believe this story would have worked as only his story, if you see what I mean. I think to help to show the impact his death had on the people around him, that's where I needed to have the other characters come in. Um, and that's why the healing touch is a novel and not a biography. Okay, so the next question. Again, this was several people wanted to know this. Um, they wanted to know what happens between Angelo and Isabel. Do they stay together? And the answer is, truthfully, I don't know. These characters created their own world. And I think I'll have to write more to find out what happens to them, you know. Um, so in the same vein, Claire wondered if Angela would really be able to fulfill Isabel in the, wrong, in the long run. And I found that a very interesting question. Because relationships change and shift and develop. And I do wonder that if once their adoration for each other and their passionate sexual relationship becomes more commonplace for them, do they have anything in common? Is there anything else that binds them? You know, is their bond strong enough to withstand the sort of humdrum of everyday life? Or is it just because it's their meeting, you know, a few times a week that keeps it together for the moment? It would appear that as though they had tried to be together, though. Um, if we go back right to back to the beginning of the book, we see there's a snippet um, of a life that they supposedly lived before in 1748 in Venice so I don't know will they succeed this time <laughs> like I said I think I'll have to write more to find out um, what they're going to tell me in fact it's one of the, the aspects of writing I adore the most it's how the characters take you on a journey of their own and sometimes you discover it as you write it you don't know what's going to happen um, but the one thing I do know is that so many people go through life without ever experiencing something like they have, a love like that. And that has to count for something, don't you think? Okay, so the next question. Elizabeth and Claire both wanted to know what, what was the purpose of the Corrin episode? Another good question, actually. Um, I think I wanted to show that often we find ourselves in love with someone or we are already with someone and we seem to take them for granted and then someone like Corin appears and stirs up things and and then suddenly we experience jealousy and all kinds of insecurities and stuff and it's kind of like a wake-up call you know I think we live in such a fast-paced world we're so intent on doing and and achieving things that I feel we're often almost disconnected from our own feelings and only when something like this happens do we even recognize what we're feeling you know I'm not saying the feelings aren't there I just think that we sort of we suppress it a bit or we we, we get busy and we do other things and we don't pay attention to how we actually feel and so sometimes when someone like a Corin person comes on the scene and elicits a kind of interest in the other person that we're with, we kind of feel, hmm, 
you know, something's not right here. And in this case, in Isabel's case, I wanted to show that it was the first time she realized that she might actually have some feelings for Angelo. Because I think until then, she genuinely thought she could just have a sexual relationship with someone and that she would not fall in love with him. And this is the first time she realizes that, oh, she may have feelings for him other than she thought. I mean, it is one of the things that really fascinate me. I, human nature is endlessly fascinating. <laughs> okay, so the next question. Right, next, um, Alban wanted to know what happens to Lee. Will he ever be held accountable for what happened? And I think that's another very good question because um, I actually plan to write an entire novel about Lee. He's an utterly fascinating character to me. Um, but to answer her question, yes, I do feel he will be held accountable, but the question becomes, by who? Clearly not by the authorities because they, they let him go. They, they didn't feel he was guilty of anything. But he clearly is feeling guilty. He clearly there is something going on there and I I think he might hold himself accountable like we all do um, I mean but does he have the intelligence and the moral standing to do that it's a strange question but I do believe he does I, I feel that he actually even in this novel has already created his own prison in which he's haunted by the ghosts of his own mind I mean isn't that what many of us do anyway in some form or another so it would be interesting to find out more about Lee as well I can't wait <laughs> to find out what he has to say um, okay so then a number of readers have raised the spiritual aspects in the healing touch and that's a, a bigger question so I, I will respond to that in my next vlog so meanwhile, thank you very much for watching. Please feel free to ask your own questions and or to leave comments below. And thank you again so much for reading the book. I'm so incredibly grateful that everybody who has read it so far and has taken the time to get in touch with me seem to have enjoyed it. So until next time, goodbye.